Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be breaking down the Texas Children's Houston Open this week on the PGA Tour. This is an event that has been shifted around on the PGA Tour schedule, and it's kind of created a second Texas swing for the PGA Tour. You know, we're going to have two tournaments coming up in Southern Texas, and then later on in May, we're going to have two um, PGA Tour events coming on up in Northern Texas. So, um, you know, just another event, you know, kind of on the PGA Tour schedule that's going to be in Texas, and this one is going to be really interesting. We've got a great field. We are going to break this event down in every way possible for you. We are going to take a look at the course itself and what type of skill sets and what type of golfers should play well here, and then we're going to look at the board and try to figure out who we need to be playing or not playing in DFS or betting outright or any kind of other bets or just you know playing one and done. So We've got you covered no matter what your game is here this week for the Houston Open. Now, while you're here, please hit the like button on YouTube and please rate and review the podcast. It really does help me out a ton and I really do appreciate it. And go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that way you can be with us for the rest of the PGA Tour season. We've got Masters Week coming up, y'all. And we're going to have a lot of content coming your way for Masters Week because the Masters is my favorite golf tournament on earth. It's one of my top five favorite sporting events on the calendar. So with that big event coming up, you're going to want to be here for that. So make sure you're subscribed so that way you can be notified when new episodes drop and you can be the first to view all of the content that we're going to have coming your way for the week of the Masters, which is coming up soon. All right, so um, let's not dilly-dally and waste any more time. Let's go ahead and dive right into breaking down Memorial Park Golf Course. So what's really interesting about this week is that this is really the first of this exact kind of Houston Open. So the Houston Open has been a long-running event on the PGA Tour schedule, but it has not been at this golf course very long. Memorial Park has only hosted this event in the last three years, where it was played there in um, 2020, 2021, and 2022. Memorial Park did not host a PGA Tour event in the calendar year 2023 because they moved the event from what was normally in the fall swing in November to now being here in the spring in March. So this is really the first edition of this event that has been played in March, especially one that is at this golf course at Memorial Park. Now, traditionally, this has been a very difficult track, and it's been a very difficult event. Might it play a little bit differently in a different season than it had in the past? I think that is absolutely a possibility. So we're going to break down just what Memorial Memorial Park has been like and what it might be like here this week. So Memorial Park is a par 70 and is over 7,400 yards. That makes it the second longest par 70 on the PGA Tour schedule, trailing only Eastlake. And it has five par threes and three par fives, but the par fives are not exactly gimmies. They're not easy holes. Um, they're not just like these automatic birdie holes that you see often on the PGA Tour schedule. And the reason why the course is so long is because half, five out of 10 of the par fours are over 490 yards. That means that with the par fives that golfers are going to be going for in two shots and the long par threes and the long par fours, there's going to be a lot of long approach shots here at this course this week. That's part of what makes it so difficult. Now, this golf course has been designed by Tom Doak. It is the only stateside course that is played yearly that is designed by Tom Doak on the PGA Tour. Um, the other course that Tom Doak did design that is played is the Renaissance Club, which is the home of the Genesis Scottish Open. What's real interesting, though, is that this course was redesigned in 2019 with a a lot of input from Brooks Kepka. Now, what's interesting about that is normally that a lot of these redesigns that they get a player to consult with, they're normally just, you know, getting a name to try to drum up publicity or try to drum up hype for it, right? Well, I don't think that was the case. I think Brooks actually had a lot of input. We all know Brooks loves his major championships, right? And, and he's just showing up to golf to play in major championships. Well, what they did was they made this golf course play very similar to major championship conditions. In the fall, it has played very firm, very fast. Um, it has tree-lined fairways, but the fairways themselves are not narrow. They're, there's pretty wide landing zones um, here on this course, and the rough is not very penal. Um, so as long as you don't have a big miss, you're not going to be dealing with the trees. But what makes this course so difficult is not what it presents off the tee. It's the fact that a lot of the approach shots are very long, and these long approach shots are into very firm, very fast, very undulated greens, which are really difficult to hold with a long iron. So how can a golfer kind of mitigate that difficulty? Well, driving distance certainly helps because it means you're going to be hitting less of a club into the green than the others. And being a really good golfer at um, with your long irons is, is something that will help as well. And we're going to talk about a few key stats that you can look for to pick up on if a guy is good with their long irons. Now, traditionally, 
these Bermuda greens, these Bermuda greens have been very firm and faster at this course. They're also generally elevated from the rest of the golf hole, meaning that you're going to have to get a shot up in the air to land on top of them. And, and if you know you have too much roll, it's going to roll right off and down a hill. Um, what you see a lot of at this course is there's a lot of like shaved runoff areas around the greens. And what I mean by that is there's not a whole lot of bunkers and there's not a whole lot of rough around the greens. A lot of the short game shots here at this course are going to be off of short grass into greens that are above where they're hitting, which is very difficult. If you've ever played golf on a course that is like this, it, it's very difficult to do because you've got to get a chip that is going to kind of have the right arc on it and land at the right spot and, and roll out the right distance. And it's a lot of calculations. And if you're off by just a little bit, you're not going to be able to stick the ball close. And we all know in golf, when you're not able to stick it close, it just increases the degree of difficulty of that putt. And you're going to see less birdies and less pars here at this course because of it. Now, I do think there are a lot of things that you can look at that will help mitigate some of that difficulty. One thing to also consider, I don't think the greens are going to be as firm and as fast this year. With it being in March, you're going to see the kind of greens this week that we have seen the last two weeks on the PGA Tour in terms of the Bermuda grass with a Poa Trivialis overseed. I've said this a few weeks now, I'm no agronomy expert, but these are the same types of greens that you see at TBC Scottsdale, at the Pete Dye Stadium course, at TBC Sawgrass, at the Copperhead course. What it's designed to do is to, you know, kind of fill in a dormant Bermuda and it makes them really smooth and really carpety, and it's just a different surface to put on. And some guys, Scotty Scheffler, have had a really good knack for putting on that type of green. So I think that with the green grass being slightly different this year, I do think that that's going to make the short game a little bit easier and definitely make it slightly different than it has in years past. Now, when we look at the key stats here at Memorial Park, um, one thing you can look at is what guys did last year when they won um, and look at the types of guys who have won this event. In the three years that it's been at Memorial Park, Carlos Ortiz, Jason Kokrak, and Tony Finau have been the winners. All three of those guys are elite drivers of the golf ball. All three have had success in other courses in Texas, um, and all three have had a lot of success in firm and fast conditions, right? That, that's no real surprise. Um, and then when you look at the leaderboard last year, um, one thing that really interested me was that pretty much everybody at the top of the leaderboard gained strokes around the green and gained strokes putting. With as difficult as this course generally plays, if you're not getting up and down, you're going to be losing strokes to the field. Um, in fact, last year at this course, only three golfers who uh, finished in the top 10 lost strokes putting, and that was Adam Hadwin, Joel Damon, and Scotty Scheffler. So pretty much you're going to have to be either elite tee to green or really good in the short game if you want to win here at this golf course. Now, I do think you can look a little bit at course history here. Like I said, I'm not going to like, I wouldn't say that like course history is going to be super predictable this week with, with it being at a different time of year than what we're used to. Um, but the best golfers at this course, um, last year you had two guys debut and finish in the top three. That was Tyson Alexander and Ben Taylor. But out of everybody who's played it all three years, Tony Finau is the top dog. He has a win, a T24, and a missed cut. Joel Damon has played here two years and finished T5 and T9 in both years. Um, after that, guys who have played this event more than once who have great history. Alex Smalley has two top 15s. Scotty Scheffler has not finished worse than 32nd in all three editions. Aaron Rye has two top 20s. Mackenzie Hughes has three top 30s. And then Steven Yeager, T35 and T9. So um, definitely an eclectic group of names there that, that all have a varying kind of skill set. But what I think you're kind of seeing the trend of is pretty much you're either going to have to be long off the tee and good with long irons or an elite short game player. Those are kind of the two pathways to being successful here at this course. And so we talk about our key stats every single week here on this PGA Tour season. And so my key stats from Memorial Park is I want to see driving distance, um, as we talked about, that's going to help you out a lot this week. Club head speed and apex height are two metrics that I like to use. This is generally indicative of people who are good at long iron play and who are good at um, getting their ball to stop on greens like this one where you're going to have runoff areas. You know, if you're getting the ball higher in the air at a faster speed, that is going to allow it to come to rest quicker. Um, so I do think that those are two traits that are going to help out this week. Strokes gains approach is pretty much going to be important every single week. Um, and then I do want to look at scrambling and bogey avoidance as well for around the green. Another thing I think you can look at is greens in regulation gained. Are they hitting more greens than the rest of the 
field. Now, in terms of comp courses here for this course, I think there is a lot of courses that kind of take one or two characteristics. I don't think there's a true like brother or sister course. Um, so for my comp courses, I have Southern Hills, which is kind of another lengthy style, elevated green, shaved grass, short areas, par 70 difficult course that did host the PGA championship in 2022. I think that's the best one-to-one -one comparison. I think you can look a little bit at all Texas courses. Um, you know, that includes Colonial, TBC San Antonio, TBC Craig Ranch, um, the previous hosts of all the Texas events. I think you can look at those as well, just because Texas golf is usually firm and fast, a lot of wind. Um, you know, you, you kind of see a lot of the same names pop up there. Riviera Country Club, and I think works as well um, because you have those short game areas, um, you know, like we talked about here um, with, the, with the short grass, and you've seen a lot of crossover success there. Tony Fino has had a lot of success at both those venues. Same deal with Torrey Pines and Vedanta Vallarta. Those are two courses where off the tee, they're very forgiving, um, and, you know, you can kind of spray it a little bit, but you're going to have a long iron into the green, um, and you're going to have to be able to um, get up and down or make birdies um, because those are both courses that feature very large greens. All right, so let's go ahead and take a quick breather, and then we're going to take a look at the rabbit hole stats for the week. All right, so if you've been with us for about the past month now, you are aware of the tool that we have started using called the Rabbit Hole. It is a product by Bet Spurts Golf. I am a big fan of this product. It allows you to really filter out and, and differentiate a lot of different conditions that really allows you to get creative and really hone in on certain skill sets and certain characteristics that you want in picking golfers for DFS betting and when it done and any, any other game you're playing for that matter. So um, I do want to look at a few stats from the Rabbit Hole this week. Before we go look at the board, um, so the first thing that I want to look at in general is just who are the best approach players and who are the best players in total um, here recently on the PGA Tour. And no surprise, the top 10 golfers in the last 30 round strokes game total um, starts with Scotty Scheffler and then Wyndham Clark, Alex Noren three, Sahid Thigala four, Tom Hoagie number five. If we flip it to just approach though, which which is important every single week, Tom Hoagie number one, followed by Scotty Scheffler, Keith Mitchell, Wyndham Clark, and Tony Finau rounding out the top five five. Um, what I do want to also look at while we've got just the general conditions here um, is a few miscellaneous metrics, which are what we talked about earlier with, um, you know, what are some things that you can look to identify for golfers who are good at long iron play. And one of them is apex height. So the top five at apex height this year have been William Furr, Chris Goderup, Thomas Dietrich, Kevin Chappell, and Jason. Day. And if you flip that over to club head speed, you see just a, a who's who collection of bombers. Kevin Doherty, Cameron Champ, Chris Gatterup, Tony Finau, and Gary Woodland with Jake Knapp, Wyndham Clark, Alejandro Tosti, Richard Hoey, and Thomas Dietrich rounding out the top 10. Thomas Dietrich popping up in both of those in the top 10 as well as Chris Gatterup and Kevin Doherty. Um, those would be the guys I would describe as flushers of the golf ball right now. Now, another stat that I do want to look at in general is just bogey avoidance. So um, who is able to save par better better than anyone else in the field. And, and the top guys in bogey avoidance in this field are Henrik Norlander, Scotty Scheffler, Alex Noren, Adam Long, and Penn Silverman. It's very interesting to me that Scotty Scheffler pops up as second on that, even though we all know the woes that he has had putting, but he's just so good at chipping that even when he misses the green, he's able to find a, you know, find a way to get up and down, and the putts that he misses are often for birdie and not for par. Now, another thing I want to look at this week, is how guys play in par 70s. So um, the best players in par 70s in the field are Scotty Scheffler, Wyndham Clark, Will Zalatoris, Ches Revy, and Sahid Tagawa. That's one I want to look at because you're not going to have a lot of opportunities to score on par 5s, and, and scoring tends to be a little bit tougher in general on par 70s. Now, in, we're going to go from tee to green here now for... Um, Oh, excuse me, not yet. Um, we're going to look at difficult scoring conditions, which I do expect this to be. So the top five in difficult scoring conditions are Scotty Scheffler, Will Zalatoris, Wyndham Clark, Sahit Tagawa, and Steven Yeager, with the top 10 being rounded out by K.H. Lee, Tony Finau, Justin Suh, Joseph Bramlett, and Ben Griffin. Now we're going to go tee to green with, with different attributes that I expect to help out. Um starting with off the tee uh, and then working our way down. So who are the guys who are good at gaining strokes off the tee when there is short rough, meaning there's not a whole lot of penalty for missing the fairway, right? Um, so it means generally that you're going to be able to bomb driver a little bit more. Um, and so the guys that are best in that category are Scotty Scheffler, Luke List, Joel Damon, Gary Woodland, and Keith Mitchell with Cameron Champ just barely finishing outside the top five. Um, and then after that, I want to look at approach. 
on long courses and big greens because um, these greens are quite large and this course is quite long for a par 70. So the leaders in that category, Scotty Shuffler, Tom Hoagie, Tony Finau, Andrew Novak, and Jake Knapp are your top five. Um, if there's a name that's been popping up quite a lot, um, you're not the only one that's noticed, I promise. Um, now, next up, I do want to look at around the green boys. So in general, scrambling on large greens, um, who is the best? William Fur, Siwoo Kim, Aaron Baddeley, Ben Silverman, and Grace and Sig. William Furr, it's kind of a red flag that he only has four rounds, but this, this is a newly promoted golfer from the Corn Ferry Tour, so not a whole lot of data to go off of for him. Um, now, what if I do look at around the green play in general still, but from short grass, so not from the rough, not from a bunker, but well, from like one of these shaved short grass or um, shaved short grass areas that we're going to see here this week. And the top in the field in that category, it's a lot of euros, surprisingly. Alexander Bjork, Thor Bjorn Olsen, Doug Gim, Jorge Campillo, and Alex Noren as your top five, with Grayson Sig, Kirk Kitayama, Joseph Bramlett, Taylor Moore, and Scotty Scheffler rounding out the top ten. You know I had to get Scheffler in there one way or another, right? Now let's also look at strokes gain putting on all the courses who have similar grass to this one. And the top five are Sam Ryder, Taylor Montgomery, Ben Griffin, Aaron Baddeley, and Justin Suh. Now, last one for... Um, before we take a look at the whole model, I just want to look at strokes gained Texas. So who are the best golfers in the, this field in the state of Texas in the last three years? And that is Scotty Scheffler, Alex Noren, Tony Finau, Daniel Berger, and Gary Woodland as your top five. And then I threw together a mismatch list of comp courses and the best golfers in the field in those comp courses are Will Zalatoris, Tony Finau, Scotty Scheffler, Jason Day, and Jake nap. Now, who is going to pop up as number one when we throw all that together along with a few other stuff into a custom model? And well, the first run of the model, to nobody's surprise, popped out Scotty Scheffler as my number one player. It is currently not loading if you're watching on YouTube though, but I can tell you for a fact, number one is Scotty Scheffler. I need it to load. I'm going to refresh the page. So um, after Scotty Scheffler, though, um, the, the round round out in the top 10 is actually most of the golfers who are priced near the top of the board in the betting market and on DraftKings. Um, and so those are, um, it, it should really not come as that many surprise. I think I did a pretty good job on the model given who came out at the top. Two is Wyndham Clark, followed by Tony Finau, Jason Day, and Steven Yeager in the top five. Rounding out the top 10 is Siwoo Kim, Jake Knapp, Sahit Tagawa, Patrick Rogers and Billy Horschel. The first golfer under $8,000 that popped up in my model was Ben Griffin at 17, followed by Chris Goderup at 18. Um, and then Andrew Novak, Taylor Montgomery, and Doug Gim um, all popped up um, around 20 as, as decent value plays. So um, those are just some names I'm going to be looking out for this week. But now that we've seen all the stats, let's go ahead and take a look at the board and see who we like. Now, also, with this model, this is just my Monday version. I generally tinker with it throughout the week, and on Wednesday, I have a finalized version. On Wednesday, I post my final model top 10 as well as my DFS core and lineup strategy to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. So if you want to get that for every PGA Tour golf tournament, it is $3 a month. And I think that it's pretty reasonable because we're also doing a ton of college basketball content right now as well. So if you want that list, head on over to Patreon and go ahead and get access to that. All right, now let's take a break and then let's take a look at the board itself. All right, so looking at the board, DraftKings has done the unthinkable. Betting markets have done the unthinkable. Scotty Scheffler is listed as $13,000 on DraftKings. He is listed as a 3-1 to one favorite to win this event. And I got to say, I kind of get it, right? Like he's won back-to-back -back events since switching to that mallet putter. His putting woes have been cured. He was already the best TD green golfer in the world. He seems to have no holes in his game right now. But you got to remember, even Prime Tiger didn't win like one third, like he won about one third of his events and, and Scotty Scheffler's already won back to back. So what are the odds he does it again? Well, uh, judging by the market, it's about 33%, right? Um, so I really 
struggle with this one. I think I'm definitely going to play him in DraftKings. Um, I will not bet him outright, though. Um, and in fact, because there is such a threat, he wins this tournament. I think the winner without Scotty Scheffler market in the outright betting market is actually a solid one to go with this week because if there's about a 30% chance he wins this tournament, it's not a 30% reduction on the odds um, for everybody else. So I think the math actually bodes well for that. Now, for Scotty Scheffler, right, to be $13,000 on DraftKings, it's quite a lot. It's twenty one hundred dollars more than the next golfer on Fanduel. He is not um, at such a gap from the rest of the competition, so he's much more reasonable to play on Fanduel. But with the new five thousand dollar range on DraftKings, I absolutely think you can play him. Like I think there's more than enough value plays to get there, right? Like you know, with him being at thirteen thousand dollars, if you click him into a lineup, you have seventy four hundred average salary remaining, which there's plenty of guys seventy four hundred and below that you can get to. Even if you wanted to go with another one of the big dogs like Wyndham Clark, you still have sixty five. 500 remaining average salary and there's plenty of guys down there you, you can go get um, because there is a $5,000 range. So I absolutely think that playing Scotty this week is the move in DraftKings. If you were to fade him, you would need him to come in like his floor performance, which is like 10th. And then you would also need to get right playing the other guys. And, and I think it's just much easier to just go ahead and click Scheffler and try to get the other five guys right than, than try to get the other six guys right. So um, I'm going to be playing a lot of Scheffler this week. One thing that I think is interesting in terms of DraftKings is once you have Scheffler, trying to find the predictable way that people will build their lineups off of this is going to be the strategy. What I'm probably going to be doing is I'm probably going to be taking Scheffler and then taking one of the other big dogs here in this tournament, of which I think there are four. You have Wyndham Clark, who is coming off of back-to-back runner-up finishes to Scotty Scheffler in elevated events where he has pretty much gone shot for shot with Scheffler. You have Sahith Thagawa, more on him in a second. You have Will Zalatoris, who's a great long iron player, had great recent form this calendar year, generally plays well in the state of Texas also. And then you have Tony Finau, who has won this event, coming off of a disappointing miscut at the Valspar. Bar, but his approach play has been really solid, and he's also had a lot of success in the state of Texas. But if I were to play any of those four, though, I'm picking Sahid Tagawa. Um, his recent form is just absolutely incredible. Um, his last five starts, 20th, 5th, 37th, 6th, and 9th. He has gained with the putter in all five of those starts. He's gained off the tee and on approach in four of them. He's gained around the green in two of them. Now, what's interesting is he's generally a pretty good around the green player dating back to last year. So I think that around the green play will turn around. And you look at his history at this event, he finished 22nd here last year and was outstanding around the green. He's a really crafty short game player that I think that this bodes really well for him. And the fact that his weakness is accuracy with the driver, and that's not really punished all that much here at this course. I think this is a great spot for Scythe, and I'm definitely going to be starting a lot of lineups this week with Scotty and Scythe, and I think Scythe makes for a great outright bet to win this turn. Now, after that kind of big group, though, I think there's a little bit of a fall off. You know, you have Siwoo Kim, who's been great on approach recently. I think he's a little overpriced. Jason Day has been great in the state of Texas, but he's just not really been great recently. He's been good, but not great. Um, and then you have Alex Noren, um, who's been Really good for Alex Noren recently, but that, I, I think $9,400 on DraftKings is a little bit overpriced. He's also a guy who plays really well in the state of Texas. And then you have two elite ball strikers, Keith Mitchell and Tom Hoagie. Um, but I think that all the guys in this range are, are pretty similar. And, and I think that I would rather just, if I'm building a lineup, I would rather pay up to get to Finau, Zalatoris, Tegal, or Clark than to get anybody else there in the 9K range. Now, a guy who did pop up on my custom model was Steven Yeager. So Steven Yeager has played well at difficult golf courses in his career. He's played well at long golf courses in his career. He's played well at golf courses that have these short game chipping areas um, with, you know, the fairway grass in his career. So I think that Steven Yeager checks a lot of boxes. And I think that a lot of my lineups this week, I'm either going to start Scheffler and then one of the next four or go all the way down to Steven Yeager and save a little bit of salary there. Now, for the rest of the AK range, Aaron Rye popped up for the course history here at this course. Um, Doug Gim has been absolutely elite on approach recently. Um, his run of top 20 finishes came to an end at the Valspar, but his approach play has still been pretty solid. Um, and believe it or not, he is a Texas guy. He went, he went to college at the University of Texas. And when he was at Texas, everybody thought he was going to be better than Scotty Scheffler, which um, turns out they were kind of wrong about. But Doug Gim. 
Really solid option at $8,200. I don't mind that play one bit. I don't mind Jake Knapp either. He has shown a long approach prowess when you look at the courses he's played well at. T3 at Farmers, win at Mexico, T4 at the Cognizant Classic. Like Those long approach numbers have been really good for him. Um, and so I really do think I'm going to be going back to Jake Knapp at $8,000. Now, Mackenzie Hughes is the next guy I want to talk about, though, because he honestly could have won the Valspar. And he did it by being super elite with the putter and just kind of treading water in the other categories. But Mackenzie Hughes will do this with the putter, though, and he's a great short game player. He's pretty much gained um, around the green in every start this year except for one at the Farmers. Um, and then you look back at what he's done at this event, the three times that it's been at Memorial Park, T7, T29, T16, been really good shipping and putting in all those additions. And really with him, like he's not a long hitter by, by any means, but he'll keep it in the the fairway he'll put himself in good positions and in difficult scoring conditions sometimes that's worth a little bit as well and, and being able to get up and down is worth a lot as well we have seen him pop up at u.s opens as one of the you know kind of the you know a top golfer for a few days at u.s opens because he is able to play difficult golf courses very well because of his unique skill set now, after that, I'm not going to talk up a whole lot of golfers from here. Um, Cam Davis, I think his skill set works really well for this course, but he's not been playing well recently. Ben Griffin popped up on my custom model. Akshay Batia, you know I'm going to play Akshay every week he's in, y'all. Um, T17 at the Valspar, I think he's back, and I think this is a course that fits his skill set really well with it being a long, iron-driven golf course. And then Luke List has played well at a lot of my comp courses. You know, um, T2 at Riviera, he has won at Torrey Pines before. This is a guy who's really good at driving the golf course ball and um, that's going to put him in a really good position this week and if his short game shows up he does have a winning upside after that, Joel Damon has really good recent form, um, but he and Sam Ryder also has really good recent form, but Sam Ryder has done it all with the putter, so I'm not exactly super eager to go back to Ryder. I do really like Andrew Novak, though. So he broke a lot of people's heart with a missed cut at the player championship where he just dunked a few water balls um, and then went about his day. Um, but he's back to being the player that we thought he was. Um, before the putters. Like he was elite on approach at the Valspar Championship, gained strokes around the green and putting as well, um, en route to a T17 finish. And I think he can continue to be that guy, which he has shown us to be throughout this year, where he's an elite approach player, elite around the green player, and can be up and down and hit or miss off the tee and putting. But if all four of it shows up, I do think he has the upside to win this event at a course that is going to demand a lot from approach play. Now, another guy that I wasn't really all that familiar with until this weekend was Chandler Phillips, um, you know, before he kind of contended and, and came close to winning the Valspar. And really, I kind of like the profile when I look at it. He has gained strokes on approach in every event that he's played this week ex or this year, except for the Farmers Insurance Open. Um, and that's going to bode well for you. Like if you're gaining strokes on approach, I think that's the most predictive, sh like, in like strokes gain category. And so if he's gaining on a stroke strokes, or if he's gaining strokes on approach, there we go, week in and week out, then he's going to put himself in position to play well at this event. Last year, he made the cut and finished 70th, was elite with the putter, but terrible in all other categories. Well, he's better at all those categories now. So if he still brings the putter and ups the other categories, he should be all right to play well here at this event. Scott Stallings is a guy that um, tends to pop up on courses that feature a lot of long approach shots also. Um, you know, T12 at the Valspar, prior to that, he had missed four straight cuts. So if you trust what he did at the Valspar, I don't think he is a bad option. Joseph Bramlett is a guy whose skill set, I think, should work perfectly here at this course. Um, you know, he's a great driver of the golf ball. He is great in terms of long approach play, and he has shown that at courses that require long approach play. T25 at the Farmers, T38 in Mexico, T48 at the Cognizant. Um, I think that he's able to play well at those type of courses and able to play well here at this event. Grayson Sig is another guy who tends to excel at long approach shots, and he came 45th at Valspar last week, 19th in Mexico earlier. Um, he checks a lot of boxes for me. He also showed up on a lot of those short game metrics that I really like this week. Cameron Champ is an elite driver of the golf ball that tends to spray it a little bit off the tee, but that really won't hurt you this week. And, and at the two courses that he's played recently that are like that, T24 at Mexico, T26 at Valspar. So I really do think that this could be a pretty good spot for Cameron Champ. He generally has one good week before he pops off, and at $6,400, he'll go a long way to allowing you to play a lot of the other top dogs in your lineup. 
Now, in terms of super values, Chris Goderup continues to pop up on any kind of like miscellaneous metric you look at, like ball speed, club head speed, apex height. And so he's just a really good flusher of the golf ball. He really strikes the ball well. And I would tend to think that eventually that's going to lead to some success. And so why not at a course that is going to be very long and a course that is going to be very difficult? Why not pick a guy who's just going to hit the ball well? Um, I do like Nate Lashley as a deep value play also. He tends to pop up on courses that feature long approach shots. And it's, you know, from a DFS perspective, he's a guy who either misses the cut or finishes 13th or better. In fact, dating back to November, that's what he's done. He's either missed the cut or finished in 13th or better. He can really have spike approach weeks. He can really have spike putting weeks. You never really know when they're going to come, but I like him on courses that feature long approach shots, and I like him on courses that feature um, a lot of short game involvement. So um, I do think this is a pretty good spot for Nate Lashley. And again, he's another guy at $6,000 who will allow you to fit in a lot of the bigger names into your lineup. The last guy that I'm going to mention is Henrik Norlander. Actually, I got one more after him. Um, he's been really good recently, like deceptively. Um, 13th at Mexico, 15th in Puerto Rico. Um, hasn't played a ton of events, but um, you know, if that's a sign of anything to come, then then $5,700 is a very reasonable price tag for him. And then Parker Cooty is also $5,700. He's a Texas guy, went to the University of Texas, um, and has just been kind of like on a little made cut role since the start of the calendar year, only missing the cut at the American Express and at the Puerto Rico Open. And at $5,700, if you just get a guy who makes the cut, that will pay off his price tag. All right, so let's take a little bit of a breather here, and then let's talk about the one-and-done strategy for the week. All right, so um, it has been a... Not great one and done season for me so far, but the good news is, is we still got a lot of schedule left. We still got the four majors, still got some elevated events, still got plenty of opportunities to increase that amount of cash that we have for our one and done entries. And the downside is that this week is not one of those elevated events. So I will allow everybody else to play Scotty Scheffler this weekend one and done if they want to. I'm going to save Scotty for another elevated event or maybe a FedEx Cup playoff event, maybe a major, but it's going to be somewhere where he can earn me a ton of money because winning this event would be the same as coming like T4 at an elevated event. And he can do T4 at an elevated event in his sleep. So um, I would rather just wait until a spot like that to use him. And I think I feel the same way about Wyndham Clark as well. You know, he's won an elevated event already this year. He's shown an ability to win majors. He, he won one last year. So definitely two guys that I'm going to wait on in terms of one and done. Now, a guy that I don't feel the need to wait on is Sahith Tagawa. Um, I don't really see anywhere else on the schedule where I would want to use Sahith. And um, I don't think that there's going to be another event down the line where he's going to show up and be like the stone cold favorite. I, I just don't see that really happening. So I think that this is a pretty good spot to go side that of course that fits in pretty well with good form coming in. He checks a lot of boxes for me. Jason day. I also think checks a ton of boxes. You know, he's played great in Texas historically. Um, he's good at these types of courses that require long approach shots. So I wouldn't mind going Jason day this week either. Um, same goes for Tony Fino. I do think Tony Fino has a few courses down the stretch that you could use him at. He's one here at this event. He's won the 3M Open. He's won the Rocket Mortgage. Um, so I do think that if you are if you still have Finau left in the tank, this is not a bad spot to go with Tony Finau. Or if you want to try to save him from one of those summer events, I don't think that's a bad strategy either. Same for Will Zalatoris. I think you can make the argument that Will Zalatoris is turning into a signature event type of guy. Um, but I think this is a course that fits his skill set pretty well. I don't see a whole lot of like really courses that I'm going to go out of my way to use Zalatoris at through the rest of the year, but he's a guy that his game will kind of translate anywhere. So I don't think that you have to go Zalatoris here, but I don't think this is a bad spot for him either. Um, the other guys that I would consider this week, Siwoo Kim, Jake Knapp, um, Alex Noren, Steven Yeager. Um, I think all of them set up pretty well here at this course. And I think they all make for solid picks that you're not probably going to want the rest of the season. Um, but to me this week, I want to go ahead and knowing that I'm behind a little bit, I want to kind of get a little bit aggressive this week. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to save this guy for anywhere else on the schedule. I'm going to go ahead and go with Sahit Tagawa. Um, that's going to be my guy this week, and I'm hoping that a lot of people will not opt to pick him, um, but I do think he makes sense as the best pick this week. You know, the last thing you want to do is is end up having a lot of guys left over at the end of the season that you could use, um, and I don't think that there's going to be another spot down the schedule that I want to use Sahith, so I'm going to go ahead and roll him out here this week at Houston. 
All right, so that does it for our 2024 Houston Open Preview. Um, hopefully, we're able to give you guys plenty of information that's going to help you pick the winners in DFS, outright betting, and one and done this week. If you like what you saw in this video, please hit the like button for me. It helps me out a ton. Please rate and review the audio if that's how you're listening as well. Um, and then also subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the audio feed. That way you can be with us for the rest of PGA Tour season, including Masters Week, which is coming up in two weeks. The Masters, a tradition unlike any other. It's the best, and I love it. And there's going to be a ton of, ton of content coming your way for it, so make sure you're subscribed so you can be here for that. All right, so that does it for this week, y'all. Best of luck to you with all the picks and the bets for the Houston Open. Um, otherwise, thank you guys for listening, and I will see you guys next time.